Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Uh, we're going to be looking at some of the characters that surround the events of Bethlehem. Now, one of the things that you uh, <clears throat> need to conclude is that uh, really there was no extraordinary people around. There was no significant people around Bethlehem. Uh, these are not overly important people around Bethlehem. The only thing that made them special is the same thing that would make any of us special. And that's the proximity of Jesus. It's just because of their nearness to Christ. And that's the only thing that makes us special is um, the nearness of the Lord Jesus. Now, if we study the lives of those who were close to Jesus, maybe in the process of that, we'll be able to discover also <clears throat> some of the joy and the peace uh, that they themselves possessed. Uh, so let's go to God in prayer, and after the prayer, we'll do a little something different this morning. Father, um, I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to be receptive to that which you would have for us this morning. Uh, Lord, uh, the uh, barriers that physically have erected, I pray that you would help me to overcome them. Uh, I pray that my voice or my throat would not be a distraction, uh, but that, God, I would be a willing vessel to be used of you that would be uh, open and, and ready to be used. Now, in Jesus' name and for his sake, I pray, amen. Well, <clears throat> today I'll uh, ask your indulgence. I normally, since we've uh, gone away from the uh, guest reception room, I've tried to get out into the hallways and just be available to people and, and to meet and greet people. Uh, this morning, I don't think it'd probably be a good idea for us to shake hands or to bump fists. Uh, I wouldn't even touch my elbow if I were y'all, so you'll understand, I am sure. Normally, <clears throat> when I preach, I will uh, read a passage of Scripture. Uh, we will explain that passage of Scripture. We'll illustrate that passage, and then we'll try to apply that passage to our everyday life. This morning, I want to be a little bit different than that. I just want to go verse by verse through about 10 or 11 verses. And then at the end of the message, I want to try to figure out how we can apply Simeon's real waiting, if I could, uh, to what you and I may need this morning as well, okay? So bear with me as we go through. We'll pick it up now, Luke 2, and we'll begin reading in verse number 25. And uh, we're going to be looking at Simeon as an example for us today. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem. Now, you ought to underline that word. Jerusalem um, is a site that as far back as we can go in history, there's always been um, a city in that site. Uh, if you study the Old Testament, you'll discover that uh, it was named Salem at one time with Melchizedek being the king of Salem. Uh, David comes along in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and he overthrows the city and he renames it Jerusalem. And Jerusalem uh, is like, in biblical terminologies, would be like the Big Apple to us today. It'd be like New York City. Uh, one of these days, the Lord Jesus is going to return. The Bible says there's a new heaven and there's a new earth. The Bible says there's a new Jerusalem that is going to come down from God where you and I will, will live. I, th I think it's going to be a, an amazing place, this Jerusalem. Now pick it up again, if you will. And there was a, uh, a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout. Now the word just there means righteous. And we're not talking here about positional righteousness we are talking about practical, everyday righteousness. The Bible says that he was a devout man. In other words, he had the right attitude when it came to the things of God. He had determined in his life that uh, God was going to have a preeminent place in his thinking. He thought about God every day of his life. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now that's a term that frankly I had not given a whole lot of thought to or about uh, in my ministry. And you go back to um, 
the time when Jerusalem disobeyed God, turned their back on God, and they were scattered into exile. But God kept himself a remnant that he used ultimately to restore them. And the Bible says that this remnant of people were, and Simeon being a part of that remnant, uh, they were waiting on the consolation of God. Now what's that consolation mean? Well, Isaiah 41 says that he was a man of suffering. In Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says that he would be revealed and that he would bring comfort to the nation of Israel. So Simeon was a man very much like a remnant of our day that still believe, and I hope you're part of that, that still believe that God is a God of his word. And when God's word says that he is going to return, that we hold true to that, that one day as Simeon was holding on to the Messiah coming, you and I are holding on to the return of the Messiah. Verse 26. And it was revealed, I, that'd be a miss if I didn't read the last part of verse 25. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. There is the Messiah. There is the consolation of Israel. There is the uh, man that is going to bring comfort, according to Isaiah, uh, to the nation of Israel. The Bible says that it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. Now, in other words, God told and promised Simeon, Simeon, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. You're not going to see death until I keep my promise. The Bible says that that promise was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. Now, folks, let me just say, I, I'm a little bit wary of people that go around saying, God told me this, and God told me that, and God told me this, and God told me that. Now, I do believe God still speaks. I, I do believe with all of my heart. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. Uh, God spoke through visions. God spoke through dreams. God spoke audibly to the men of old. I still believe that he speaks to people from time to time, but it is extraordinary. It's not the ordinary, if you will. Uh, it, 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 and be careful of somebody that's always saying, God told me this or God told me that. But here it is. The Holy Spirit revealed the promise to Simeon, you're not going to die. So I want you to wait until that promise is fulfilled. Now, so Simeon was waiting on that to happen. Look at verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of uh, the law. Verse 28. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. Now, Every Hebrew child, firstborn child, had to be taken to the temple and presented before the temple. With that presentation, they carried with them about five shekels. And they would acknowledge, God, this is your child, but we're going to redeem him. Uh, we're going to redeem our child, and we know and acknowledge that it's, his, that it's yours, but God, we're going to buy him back, and we recognize it's yours. He's just on loan to us. And so Mary and Joseph are bringing Jesus to the temple to redeem him. Along with that, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, after the birth of a child, a woman had to go through a purification time where she would bring forth a, a, an animal, a lamb, to the temple to offer up there uh, to them for her purification. A boy was 33 days. A girl was 66 days. And this lamb was a symbol of purification. Now, if you look at verse 22, 23, and 24, you discover in there that uh, Mary and Joseph were very poor. Uh, don't buy into this stuff that they were wealthy and came from a well-to-do family. They weren't. And so God had made provisions in the law that if they could not afford the lamb, that they could bring in some turtle doves or some pigeons along the way 
and they could offer them up for her purification rather than uh, the lamb. Now notice again, uh, verse 28 says uh, that he took him up in his arms. Can you imagine that? Now think, just think, just let your mind think logically for a minute. Um, suppose the comedies came in here this morning with their brand new baby and some total stranger walked up to them and said, Hannah, can I hold your baby? Well, she'd look at you like you were crazy. I don't know you. Uh, I don't know what you're like. I have no idea what you'd be like. But here this old priest comes in and says, I want to hold this baby. And they willingly and gladly let the priest hold their child. Now notice what it says in verse 29. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to thy word. Now here's a, here's a powerful thing. Lord, I want you to release me now. That's the word depart. I want you to release me because I now have peace that what you promised me, I now have the assurance, I, I now know that this promise that you gave me years ago has now been fulfilled and I'm ready to be released from this life. Powerful terms here. Now, no, notice verse 30, if you will, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. You ought to underline that word salvation. Salvation is not a religious ritual. Salvation is not keeping a series of disciplines. It's not about doing good or refraining from doing some awful sin. Salvation is a person. I've seen him. I've seen this salvation. Now what you saved from, you're saved from the penalty, the just penalty due as a result of our sin that everybody in this room needs. Verse 31, which you have prepared before the face of all people. Here's a powerful, powerful word. We just came through Thanksgiving and uh, we got, Kathy and I got up really early uh, Thursday morning and we started the preparation for that meal. Uh, Kathy was rattling pots and pans uh, in the kitchen and then I was out on the grill and firing up that grill uh, getting ready to smoke and roast that turkey. And, and, and before long, the, the aroma began to fill our house. And then the guests showed up and we took that which we had been preparing and we presented it on this amazing table. So that which was prepared, God had been preparing while Simeon had been waiting and now he's holding the presentation that God had prepared in his arms. Now notice what it says at the latter part of that, in the face of all people, for all people, that God has prepared for everybody. Well, I want to tell you, if there's a word that our culture and our generation needs today, understand that Jesus Christ is not for just a select few. He's not just for a limited amount of people. The Bible says plainly here that God had prepared him for all people. Now, watch this, if you will, in verse 32. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Powerful words. And a light to lighten the Gentiles. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? What, what did he do? just shift there for? Because here the uh, Jewish nation had rejected the Messiah. I, I, I love it when I come to church and I'm able to pass some folks in the hallway from time to time that are Messianic Jews. And boy, they're just light, the, the, the light just shines out of their eyes. Their face is aglow. They have discovered the Messiah. And one of these days, let me just tell you, the Lord Jesus is going to return and he's going to open up the eyes of all of the Jews to the true Messiah. Now notice verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. <laughs> when I read that, I just can't help but just smile just a little bit because, you know, Jesus amazes people all the time. 
Jesus has always amazed people. If you get over into the word of God in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus cast the demon out of that old boy over there, the Bible says they were all amazed. And then in chapter 15, the Bible says that Jesus was healing all manner of diseases and sickness and the multitudes were amazed. And then when Jesus was out on the sea with the disciples and the storm came up and he spoke peace to the winds and the waves and they laid down like a bunch of whipped puppies, the Bible says they were amazed that even the winds and waves obeyed his voice. Jesus has always been in the business of amazing people. Can I just tell you this? When you encounter him, you're going to be amazed too. Look at verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. <laughs> so here he comes and he blesses Mary and Joseph. That, that's just amazing to me. If you go back and you look at verse 25, uh, here was Simeon and he was in the blessing business and, and, and he just blessed people all of the time. He blessed God, he blessed Jesus and now he is blessing Mary and Joseph. You, you know, he was just a blessing machine. Here he was, here God, I've, I've been waiting on this promise and the promise has now come to reality Bless you, God. He was just a blesser. He was all fired up because he's now seeing what he had been waiting for. Uh, then things begin to turn. Things begin to change right after that. Notice what he says there in the scripture that this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Powerful words. This child has been appointed for the collapse of many. This child has been appointed for the resurrection of many. This child has been set for the downfall of many. This child has been set for the uprising of many. In other words, for all of eternity, some are going to receive collapse. And for all of eternity, some are going to receive the resurrection. Some will accept him while others will reject him. Let me ask you a question this morning. To which has Jesus been appointed to in your life? For collapse or for resurrection? And the Bible says that this Jesus shall be a sign which will be spoken against by many. Kathy and I were just talking this week about this very, very thing. I remember when I was a boy growing up, you would never hear anybody take the name of God in vain. As I grew a little bit older, it was commonplace for GD to be used in everyday language. But if you notice the shift now, it's gone even more degrading. They are now using the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, as a term of derision. I can't stand it. it. Drives me nuts. Why don't they use Allah? You don't ever hear anybody using that term. Do you know why? Because none of the false religions are ever going to be used because the founder of the false religions is the God of this world and he is not going to try to destroy what he created. But the name of Jesus is the name one of these days that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. It is the name of Jesus that we must be saved by. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And so the enemy comes against him. Question is, where are you in regard to Jesus? A lot of people speak the name, but they don't understand it. You have him, you have life. But if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. Verse 35. Yea, a sword shall pierce through my own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I, I suspect when Mary stood at the base of the cross of Jesus, 
And she looks up and she sees her son hanging there on that cross. She remembers the words with great comfort that came to her heart, the words of Simeon. When Simeon said, Mary, you don't have a clue how your heart is going to burst one of these days. It'll be like a sword that goes through your heart when you look up and you see your son hanging on that cross. Um, powerful words. Can, can, can I maybe at Christmas time help you with something? What a person knows and believes about Jesus reveals more about them than you could ever imagine. So here we are. We're going to be celebrating Christmas. We've got the Christmas musical all lined up. And, and conversations about Jesus are more apt to take place at this time of year than any other time of year. And if you really want to know how people feel, why don't you just ask them, well, what do you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? You're going to find out more about those people than you could ever imagine. Now, what can we learn from the life of Simeon? What, what, what does he speak to us? You understand Simeon had a PhD in waiting on God. That is the message to me of the life of Simeon. You, you know, the fact of the matter is life is not filled with a bunch of green lights, is it? Oftentimes, a bunch of stop signs show up to us. But the fact of the matter is, the way most of us are wired up, the way most of us are geared up, we want to say, no, I want what I want, and I want it right now. But you understand, God has a plan for each of us. And he will say to us, I'm not going to give you what you want right now because you're not ready to receive it if I were to give it to you. And if I did give it to you now, it has absolutely no correlation into the woman that I want you to become or the man that I have for you to become. So I'm not going to give it to you now. You're going to have to wait. Now, let me give you four things that I see here from the life of Simeon that I believe that will help you. Number one, you ready? Number one, God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. If you study this out, you wonder about this old priest, how old was he when God gave him the promise? You're not gonna die until you see the Messiah. How long did he have to wait until he received the promise? Months? Years? I don't think so. I believe he waited decades for that promise to be given unto him by God. And I, I believe it would have been extremely easy for him to have doubted during that waiting period. As a matter of fact, probably some of his friends had come up to him and put doubt in his mind. Well, Simeon, my goodness, how long do you think you're going to have to wait for this? You, you must have had some bad pizza that night that you thought that God spoke to you. If God was going to do it, he'd have done it a whole lot sooner than now. And so he, they, they, they could have planted, just like your family, my family would have done, they would have planted some doubts uh, in his mind along the way. Why don't you just give up instead of living this life of faith? You know, waiting on God is hard, isn't it? I, I wonder how many of you are here under the sound of my voice this morning and you've been waiting and waiting and waiting on God to do something and he just hasn't done it. And if I were to maybe take a poll and I were to say to you, give me one word, in one word, what is the most difficult thing that you have going on in your weight? What are some of the most difficult things to have to wait on for? Let me give you a few. First of all, I believe justice is hard to wait for. You know, it grieves me almost every day now to turn my news on and to see that somebody has walked up to a police squad car where 
some policeman has been sitting trying to keep the peace and security of our land and just shoots him in the head four or five times and you wonder, God, how in the world can we get justice for this? Some of you have been done majorly wrong, maybe at a job you worked at, maybe, maybe some family member, maybe some friend stabbed you in the back, hurt you, disappointed you, robbed you of something, some injustice has occurred between you and somebody else and you've been thinking, when is this ever going to be made right? I just want you to understand something. One of these days, the God who has been keeping records of all wrongs is going to come back to this old earth of ours and he's gonna make right everything that has been wrong and there will be no voice in eternity that will ever cry out, God, when are you gonna make this right? Because he's gonna make every bit of it right. Now, let me give you a, a second one that I think is very, very difficult is reconciliation. Without a doubt, everybody in this room has suffered from this. Alienating from family, alienating from a friend, alienation from um, somebody that had one time been very close to you, but now they're not. There's some parents that are here. You have children that are way out there somewhere. You have parents that are way out there somewhere. You have a spouse that is physically or spiritually or emotionally way out there somewhere and you become disenfranchised from them and you're wondering, God, when are you ever going to reconcile this? When am I ever going to be? I miss this relationship. I miss this oneness. I, I miss my friendship and, and, and you're facing reconciliation and you're waiting. You've done everything that you know that you could do to make it right, but they're just hard-hearted and cold and indifferent and will not change. You're wondering, wow. We all know what that's like. And then I knew that this service, and I knew that the next service as well as last service, here, here's one that's tough. Hey, God, um, I see this coming out of our college career. I see it in our singles department. Hey, God, when, when are you going to bring me my life's mate? When, when, when are you, when are you going to help with this loneliness in my heart? When, when are you going to send the right woman to me? God, when are you going to send the right man? I, I want to be married. I, I have a hole in my heart and I, I want it to be filled up. When, when are you going to fix that? God, I've been waiting for so long. Hey, hey, and then one day, parents look up and there she comes with some dude and you think immediately when you see him, that ain't him. <laughs> oh yes, I love him. You don't love him. That's, you go better wait a little bit longer, honey. Hmm? Another one, tough one is conception. Some of the most difficult days I've ever had as a pastor is ministering to couples who are having a hard time conceiving children. Some of my, Kathy and I's closest friends had a really hard time with this. It ultimately, because of the struggle, it ultimately led to their demise as a marriage. It broke our hearts. And some of you crying out, God, you know, I want kids. Hey, I'd love to take you to the nursery this morning. We could open up the doors down in the nursery and we could show you a bunch of kids down there who belong to parents that some doctor somewhere along the way says you'll never be able to have kids and then one day, surprise, surprise. Wait on God, wait on the Lord. And then healing, well that's a big one. I, I could probably make a whole sermon, maybe need to devote a whole hour to that one of these days. You, you, you just had a tough time coming from the doctor and you got some malady that you're thinking, 
You've been carrying this malady around. You've been struggling with this for so long. And God, are you going to heal me? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Simeon waited on the Lord year after year after year. But but I want to give you some help here. I want to show you a couple of things here in the word of God in his example that I really believe. First of all, God keeps his promises. Secondly, the Holy Spirit will help you. Simeon didn't do it in his own strength. If you look at verse 25, the Holy Spirit was on him. If you look at 26, the Holy Spirit was on him. If you look at 27, the Holy Spirit helped him. God did not wire you up to wait. You are not manufactured to wait in your own flesh and in your own strength. God knows that you need him and that's why he sent the Holy Spirit to come alongside you to enable you in the area of waiting that you can't do yourself. You say, wait a minute, I don't know that I have the Holy Spirit. Well, you better know that you have the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that for all of us have been baptized by one spirit into the body. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says very plainly there that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are his children. And if you've ever had a time in your life that you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. That's not the issue. The issue is that there are many fillings of the Holy Spirit and you've got to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. The question this morning is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? It's a day-to-day deal. The only reason you wouldn't be filled with the Holy Spirit, there are two reasons. One is you grieve the Holy Spirit. That means that you have done some things that you know that you should not have done. Or you quench the Holy Spirit. That means that you don't do some things that you know that you should have done. Now, in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what do you got to do? I dare you sit down with a piece of paper and begin to write out the things that you've done that you know that God's not pleased with. Well, I don't know where to start. Well, I promise you, if you get your paper and your pencil and just say, God, what do you think? He will give you what you need to write down. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house? The other is God says, pray. He says to study your Bible. He says to be faithful to the church. That is what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God. All right, number three, God keeps his promises. The Holy Spirit will help you and you won't believe your eyes. The Bible says that Simeon was just stunned The Bible says that Mary and Joseph were amazed. That's what happens when we wait on God. But when we don't wait on God, here's what we do. We get a hammer, we get some wood, we get a saw, and we start making our own contraptions, and we start making our own devices, and we start putting together our own means of trying to figure out how we can achieve what we want to achieve. But then if you're waiting on God, God shows up, and you have to kick aside what you've just built in your own ingenuity because it doesn't even come close to the marvel of what God has in store for you. You just have to throw it away. I used to sing a song called, Fill My Cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. What does it mean to have your cup filled up? The Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. What does it mean? You got your cup. God gives you stuff. You put it in your cup. You press it down. You shake it up. Is it full? No. God gives you more. You push it down. You press it down. You shake it up. Is it full? No. He gives you more. And then it runs over. Psalm 23 My cup runs over. You ask. Had a, got an email this week. Came from a son 
who had been waiting and waiting and waiting on his daddy to be saved, waiting and waiting and waiting on his daddy to be changed, waiting and waiting and waiting on his daddy to come to faith in Christ. And he brought him here to hear Tim Lee, the Marine whose legs were blown off in Vietnam, you remember, and he got him the book by Tim Lee and he reads the book by Tim Lee. When he finishes reading the book of Tim Lee, he bows his head and asks the Lord to forgive him of his sins and come into his heart. And he says, now my daddy can't get enough. It's just running over. Waiting. Let me just say this. It's never too late to wait. Wait. Been waiting now for decades for God to keep his promise. Every morning, Getting up, going to the temple. Is this going to be the day that I'm going to see the promise? Suppose a couple of days before Mary and Joseph showed up, suppose that the alarm clock went off that morning and Simeon hears the alarm clock and he slams it down and knocks it off the end table. Gets up, gets his coffee, spills it all over him. You know what? I just don't think I'm going to go up there today. I think I'm just going to forget about this whole thing and just go ahead and die. But this morning, the alarm clock goes off. Gets his coffee. Goes to the temple. And here comes this sweet couple in the door carrying a baby. And all of a sudden... What if he had given in to that impulse to quit waiting? He would have forfeited everything that God had told him would be his. And some of you, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting, and you're just tired of waiting. Don't quit. It's never too late to wait. And if you quit... You're going to forfeit everything God has prepared for you. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that your promises are so powerful and so true and so real. And you have proven yourself to be faithful time and time and time again. And I pray, God, that Our cups would be so filled with faith. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt, Lord, that the best days are still ahead of us. I'm convinced of that in my own heart, my own life. I, I believe that with my whole being. Lord, we've done what we can do. And now, Lord, we're waiting on you to do what you're going to do. And Lord, for those people that are here this morning that are in need of healing... I pray that they would wait on you. I pray for that couple that may be looking for children. God, I pray that they would wait on you. Lord, for those that have broken relationships, I pray that they would wait on you. I pray for those that are struggling in their marriage, that God, they would wait on you. I pray for that man who is looking for a job, God, that he would wait on you. I pray for those, God, that have been wrongfully done, God, that they would wait on you. Lord, you've never disappointed me. The fact of the matter is I've never run into anyone yet that's ever been disappointed by you. Would you instill in us more so now than ever before that we cannot wait by ourselves? We need your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, draw near to them that are drawing near to you right now in confessing that they're tired physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And I pray that you would be the strength of every weakness that they possess. And I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.